<coughs> excuse me, praise God. Lord Jesus, bless the eyes and ears of the listeners. I plead your blood on this lesson in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I come against any foul spirits that try to come against your word and confuse your people. Let your people have eyes and ears that will listen and a heart to understand in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, let's talk about Satan's attributes. We don't want to give Satan any glory, and we're not going to, but you need to know your enemy. You need to know your enemy, his strategy, his ways. Then we're going to talk about people that uh, are going to hell. Hell. Let's talk about hell. Something that uh, is very uncomfortable for a lot of uh, ministries to talk about. Well, Jesus said, talk about it, because a lot of people are going there. And a lot of these people think they're going to heaven, and they're not. You know, and there's a reason why I teach you every day what you need to do for God from your heart to get close to God, but people don't. So let's talk about you need to hear it. Okay, I'm going to call out some verses. I don't I have other things I got to do today. I got to go get my grandkid. I got things I got to go do. So I don't have time. I'm going to call the verses out to you here. I wrote some down. Okay, so when it comes to the devil and demons, okay, most people tend to either dismiss the subject as mere superstition or or, be, or become too obsessed with the idea. I see a lot of too obsessed with this, and we're not going to get too obsessed with it, but you need to know your adversary. All right? To, to dismiss it or to become too obsessed with it, both of those are dangerous. All right, here's what we can say for sure. Satan is real. You can write that down. Satan is real. He's real. Jesus spoke matter-of-factly and often about the reality of Satan and demons. You can look it up throughout Luke chapter 10, 11, you know, uh, John 8, 4, 4, different verses. You can search it. So to deny their existence is to discount the teaching of Jesus Christ. To conclude that the Son of God was either ill-informed or either he was lying and he was neither of those satan is real and he's here satan is vicious y'all jesus called the devils he called him a murderer in john 8 44 a murderer john called him the accuser of the brothers and sisters in revelation 12 10 and in our souls following moments of you know of failure we have all heard his hateful, withering accusations when you slip up. When you slip up, oh, that's it. You really messed up this time. You lost everything you worked so hard for. No, Jesus said, do that right there. Get up and do it again. Get up, get up, get up. Repent fast when you slip up. Repent fast. Get up. Come on, I got you. Satan will try to keep you down. The Apostle Peter likened the devil to a roaring lion prowling about looking for someone to eat. Someone to devour in 1 Peter 5, 8. So no wonder he warned, be alert and sober minded. Be alert all the time and because so, he's out there looking for you. Okay, Satan is sneaky. Y'all, he's sneaky. The Apostle Paul talked about the devil's schemes in Ephesians 6, 11. The Greek word translated schemes is the word from which we get our English word methods. He's got methods. Okay, it means procedures or mechanisms, you know, that as, and has overtones of, of being crafty, cunning, wily, deceptive. Okay, in other words, Satan is the consummate fast-talking salesman, okay, who's forever trying to pull a fast one on unsuspecting people. You cannot lower your guard. You have to stay armored up. We just did that lesson the other day, and I've got other videos on here going through the, the armor, but we're going to stick to this today. You have to be armored up, okay? You have to be ready. Satan is defeated. I want you to know that he's defeated, the first man, Adam, succumbed to Satan's beguiling temptation in Genesis 3, 1 through 8. But Jesus Christ, the son of man, and the last Adam, 1 Corinthians 5, 15, 45, never did succumb to him. Matthew 4, 1 through 11, Hebrews 4, 15, 1 Peter 2, 22. Israel failed to trust God and sinned in the wilderness in Numbers 14. But Jesus did not. He didn't, he didn't fail in Luke 4, 1 through 13, and in John, 1 John 3, 5. By his sinless life, y'all, and sacrificial death, Jesus paid the price for, for sin, for sin. And what's more, in his incarnation, death, and resurrection, 
Jesus was able to destroy the devil's work. First John 3, 8, okay? While Satan attempts to inflict some final damage in the earth's warning hours, his end is already sealed, okay? So here's some characteristics of the devil. You can see him all around you. He's proud, Ezekiel 28, 17. His wisdom is corrupt, Ezekiel 28, 17. He is our enemy. Oh, I lost my place. He's evil. Okay, go over here. He accuses. He tempts. He ignores rules and laws. Don't you understand that? He ignores rules and laws. He opposes God's plan and God's ways, and he slanders. Now, for those who are ignoring God, okay, or finds that it's, uh, I gotta put this down for a minute, y'all, or finds that your day is too busy, too busy to include God in your day, you know, maybe you're doing, I don't know, work around your home or something, it's real important that you understand that uh, you need to make time for God. God gave me a verse Revelation 2, uh, let me look it up, it was 2, 2 through 5, 2, yeah, that's what it was, 2, 2 through 5, said, this is the verse he gave me for to teach the people, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not. And have found them to be liars. And you have persevered and have had and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. He's like, I know, I've seen you working for me. I've seen you doing what you're doing for me. I've seen you knowing my scripture so you can test the spirits. I see what you're doing. Nevertheless, I have this against you. That you have left your first love. This is for somebody out there, y'all. Pay attention. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Mm. Y'all, Jesus is saying, some of you, he, this word is for somebody. He gave it to me for one of you out there, maybe a few. I've seen you. You were getting right with me. You were studying. You were seeking my word. You were testing the spirits. You were using discernment I gave you to keep you on track. And somehow you're getting caught up and tangled in life. And now you're slipping. You're slipping. You're not reading my word. You're not studying my word. You're not spending time with me. You're not doing the things you was doing when you was really, really seeking me. Come back. He's saying, come back, or I will remove your lampstand from his place. Repent for slipping away from me and come back. Now, that's for somebody, okay? God gave it to me very clear to teach on today. And if you don't repent and come back, y'all, there is a, a, there's a place called a very grim and unpopular Okay, it's a very grim and unpopular subject. People don't want to talk about it. Preachers don't want to preach on it. It's afraid they're going to scare their audience off. Okay, Jesus said, teach it. Tell it. Because a lot of people are going there. And not coming out. It's not for vacation. You don't come out. Okay. So as grim and unpopular as the subject may be, the Bible speaks plainly about a real place called hell. So according to a plain reading of scripture hell is where unrepented unbelieving people will spend eternity close your eyes and try to think about eternity you can't your mind will only let you go so far in the blackness when you close your eyes so far and that's it you don't know eternity because we never experienced it it never ends just know that it never there is no end to it ever ever and your human mind can't comprehend that. So there's certain names of hell. The Old Testament uses the Hebrew word Sheol to describe the destination of all the dead. Okay, in the Old Testament. Sheol means the pit, the grave. Okay, that everybody went. Sheol is the grave. Okay, the pit and the hole where they bury your body. 
Not until New Testament times do we find clear distinctions that's being made between the final destinies of believers and unbelievers. Okay, Sheol wasn't meant to be a place where just Satan was. Sheol was the grave, the hole they dug in the ground to bury your body. Righteous or unrighteous, it was in Sheol. That's what they called the hole. We call it a grave. They called it Sheol. The New Testament time, they made a clear distinction. They're like, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, yeah, they're in the hole in the ground. Their bodies, but wait a minute, their spirits go somewhere. They're either here or there. You know, they start having an understanding. So the New Testament writers use the Greek words Hades, comparable to Sheol the, and, and the Gehenna, to speak of hell. Gehenna is the word they use for hell. Gehenna refers to the Valley of Hinnon. An actual ravine outside of the southern walls of Jerusalem. It's an actual ravine. And this site was known for two reasons. The ancient pagan practices included child sacrifice there. You can see 2 Kings 23.10 about that. Okay, and the second, the valley became over time an open landfill where refuse and the bodies of executed criminals were thrown and burned up. They were burnt there. Okay, Gehenna. So as a result, fires burn there almost continuously. Okay, let's talk about the nature of hell. The descriptions of hell in the Bible are both terrible and terrifying, y'all. Hell is said to be a place. And I know I'm very familiar with because I was walking. I was one step, y'all, from walking into that place 17 years ago. But look who showed up to, to put that hand on my shoulder. And bless me and forgive me and save me and let me live. Or I would be in that place right now. Okay, it's, it's a terrible place. It's terrifying. It's terrible. All right. It's where the unforgiven believers, unforgiven because they haven't repented. That's why they're unforgiven. It's where unforgiven believers are shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Shut out. He calls it death. Because they're now separated from God. They can't feel him. They can't smell him. They can't see him. They, there's, they're, there's, he doesn't exist to them anymore. Except for in their memory. They know who he is in their mind. They have that torment now that they turn that down. They turn him down. No way to get back to him now. Second Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1, 9. Shut out the Lord. Shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Second Thessalonians 1 9. The description of hell is uh, in 2 Peter 2, 4, chains of darkness. In Jude 13, blackest darkness. Daniel 12, 2, everlasting contempt. Matthew 25, 46, eternal punishment. Have you not had enough punishment on this earth in this lifetime? I'd be doggone if I'm going to go for eternity duplicate, dub, tripled, quadrupled, seven times worse. No way. I'm going for Jesus. It's known as torment in Luke 16, 23 and agony in Luke 16, 24. You want torment and agony for eternity? Go for Jesus. You won't have torment and agony. It's where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 8, 12. Matthew 22, 13. So the Bible also uses abundant, fiery um, images in its description of hell. The Gospel of Matthew, for example, quotes Jesus as speaking of the fire of hell, literally Gehenna. Matthew 5, 22. The blazing furnace, Matthew 13, 42. And the eternal fire prepared for who? For the devil and his angels. It wasn't prepared for you. But that's a choice you make. God doesn't send you to hell. God ain't sent nobody to hell but the devil and his angels. That's who he'll send to hell. You send yourself to hell. If you go to hell, it's because your choice. You chose it. You choose it. You have to choose, y'all. You either choose Jesus or you don't. It's a choice. You make it. It's your decision. Jesus offers eternal life and bliss, and to reject him is eternity in hell. That's your choice. It's because you make it. He don't want you to make that choice. That's why he's reaching out to you every day to repent, repent. Repent means when you say, Jesus, forgive me, you stop doing those sins you know that are wrong. You're like, well, how do I know if what I'm doing is wrong? Get in God's word and figure it out. 
That's what God's word's here for, for you to study it and know it. Find out what he tells you is wrong and right and do it. Okay, so it's prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay, so Mark speaks of hell as being a place where the fire never goes out, never goes out in Mark 9.43 and 9.48. John in the book of Revelation sees a lake of fire, Revelation 20.15, a fiery lake burning sulfur, a burning sulfur, Revelation 21.8. All right, Christians have had heated debates, y'all, over how to interpret these phrases. Are they meant to be taken literally or figuratively, on and on? So by using the flame, smoke, and the stench of Gehenna to refer to hell, all right, Jesus provided a very graphic picture of how awful eternity will be for those who reject the Lord, Jesus Christ. He didn't make no, he didn't fancy foot and tickle your ears around it. It's bad, y'all, to reject him. It's bad for you. Okay, however you interpret it, okay, these fiery references, you can safely, y'all, conclude that just as heaven will be infinitely more wonderful than we could possibly imagine, so hell will be far worse than you can ever fathom. Okay, the Bible says about hell, there will be eternal separation from God. That's hell. Eternally separate. Right now, even though you, some of you may be living in sin, God is still around you doing that right there. Do, come, 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 come. So his presence is still around you. He can't work for you and through you because you won't let him, but he's there calling you. Okay, when you go to hell, he's not there. Gone, black, gone. He's not there. You will experience torment like you've never had. There will be continual punishment. There's going to be un, unending sorrow and anger, never ending. There will be insatiable thirst, unquenchable fire, unpeasable pain and suffering. And God's wrath will be unleashed. Okay, so I want you to think about it. Get close to Jesus Christ, y'all. Repent. If you're doing things you know you, the Lord doesn't want you to do, stop doing it now. Stop, just stop. Use your willpower. Stop it. Stop it. I've heard people say, well, I have a problem with this. I can't quit. You can quit. You can quit whatever it is that you're doing. You just got to use your mind power. Or right, is it going to be a pleasant experience when you quit these things? No. But you use your willpower he gives you. Use him to help you get through it. You put it down. Put the stuff down and fight through it. Endure. Read your Bible. Read, 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 read. Stay. Pray, 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 pray. Fast. Fast. During this time you're quitting this stuff. And read and pray consistently until the pain is gone. Okay? Use him. You can do it. That's you holding you back. Satan holding you back. Okay, so if you don't know Jesus, ask him to be your savior and then just get to know him. Take his hand, y'all. Get to know him. Let him pull you up. Okay, get close to him. Some people have so much to do in their life that they find they're starting to have less and less, less time of the day to spend with him. That's no good, y'all. No good. That's to whoever that is. That's who he gave me, Revelation chapter 2, verses 2 through 5, 4. Satan uses situations to pull you away from God. He'll throw stuff up in your face, like I have to do this today, I got to do that today, I have this to do, I have that to do, and then you find out you've done gone all day. Well, I didn't really have time to read the Bible today or really pray. Um, I talked to God a little bit out, out there, you know, whatever. And then here goes two days Well, I was so busy. I've been two days now without studying God's word. And now I've been three, four, a week, month. And there you go. You're, gone, you're falling. You're falling. So you fit him in your day. That's God, y'all. That's Jesus. Fit him in your day. All right. In the name of Jesus Christ, I have things I got to go do now, but I fit him in my morning. Usually I'm here to do it all day, but I have to go do things today. I fit him in my morning and I fit him in for you too. Okay. Now you do your part. All right. In Jesus name, God bless you all. Um, I want to thank those of you who are supporting my ministry. God bless you. I know that because he will, because this is his ministry. And that's what he told you we are supposed to do to help it grow, flourish, grow, grow, grow. Why grow? To reach more people, more avenues, more people, to get more souls to God. So thank you all for supporting my ministry, God's ministry. We are Jesus doers. Jesus gave it to me, okay, to run for him, to teach you what he tells me to teach you. 
okay, to take you where he wants to take you. So thank you for supporting this ministry, all right? Um, I have on one of my shirts, the witnessing shirt. I don't know how I got mine so fast. I'll try to turn around and show you. I don't know if you can see it. It's a very comfortable shirt, too. So that's cool that y'all bought them. Um, the purpose of these shirts, y'all, real quick, is because a lot of people I teach, um, they, they're scared to witness. They don't want to witness, okay? They're, they're scared to for whatever reason, or they just can't do it. They're just not outy people. They can't do it. So you wear a shirt, okay? Does it blatantly say, live for Jesus on it? No, it doesn't. You know why? This is why Jesus told me to make them this way. Because it teaches. It's a teaching shirt. It teaches you how to witness, okay? Um, coming soon. Are you ready? Got a cross. Everybody will understand that's about Jesus Christ. You know, most people have that kind of common sense. Okay. But it may, it will bring up t-shirts that will strike conversations with people. You wear them and pray for it to strike a conversation with somebody so that they can ask you, I'm coming soon. Are you ready? They might, they might come to you and say, do you believe Jesus is, Jesus is coming soon? There's your door open to witness with your mouth. There's your door open right there. Witness. Take the opportunity, you tell them about Jesus. Let this shirt be an invite to an open door for you to witness. That's what it's about. Okay? You want to tell somebody about Jesus? Use your mouth to do it. Okay? All right. In the name of Jesus, God bless you all. There's a couple of days left to sell the shirts. They'll be in the description. They're witnessing t-shirts. They are. You don't wear it just to witness. The, the purpose isn't for the shirt to witness just for you. No, it's to open a door, a conversation piece with people to say, hey, what does your shirt mean? What exactly? I understand it's something to do about Jesus, but what exactly are you trying to say? There's your chance to open your mouth with your willpower and witness to these people and lose the fear of witnessing for Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of it. That's why he said do it that way. Okay, so in the name of Jesus, use them. And then pray when you're wearing it, pray that you will have an opportunity from somebody to, to explain it and ask them, do you know Jesus as your savior? Because he is coming soon. All right. In Jesus name, God bless y'all. Anything you need to know is in the description. Look under the video, click the little arrow. You'll it'll bring up everything. If you want to support the ministry, there's four ways you can support it there. Thank you for doing that and helping us grow. In Jesus name, God bless you.